Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So in today's session, it's going to be a short session. And in today's session, we will try to understand data frame internals. We will go inside the data frame and try to understand what is data frame and how it is physically stored, how the physical structure of data frame looks like. So that's the agenda for this session. And this session is going to uh, be first part of a continuous, maybe two or three continuous sessions about the data frame internals. In this series of two, three sessions, we will uh, completely uncover the data frame inter uh, internals. We will learn how data frames are internally structured, how it is stored uh, in a distributed manner. And when we perform uh, transformations on the data frame, uh, what happens behind the scene? What happens inside the data frame? How data frame actually applies those transformations? We will also learn that there are two types of transformations, narrow dependency transformation and wide dependency transformation. So how narrow and wide dependency transformations are different and how they internally uh, execute how things work behind the scene. Uh, that's very important to understand. Uh, that knowledge, that understanding takes you too far uh, in your uh, performance tuning, optimization, and applying best practices uh, while you are developing your uh, application. So, but um, today's session is just a starter of it. And we will only discuss uh, a little history about the data frames and uh, how it is internally stored, physically stored on the cluster in the distributed manner. So let's start with the topic. Uh, we maybe you uh, already have some uh, background understanding or some knowledge that distributed computing uh, today is modern. This distributed computing, which is popularized by data lake and lake house architectures, uh, led by Spark, was originally started with Hadoop. Right. So Hadoop did a great job in bringing distributed computing to the world, making it easy, and it came up with an idea of. Uh, a uh, simplified way of writing code, which can execute on a cluster of computers in a distributed manner. And it can scale uh, as per your uh, requirement, just adding some additional nodes to the cluster, increasing the size of the cluster, you can scale it. So we will go back in history and try to understand how Hadoop offered that uh, distributed uh, computing framework and what were the uh, problems or limitations in Hadoop, uh, Hadoop's approach. And then how is Spark tried to solve it? And that history is important uh, for, a, for a better understanding. So we will start from there. And then we will see how Spark data frame arrives and how Spark data frame is, is stored on the uh, distributed computer. And then in the next session, we will take it from there to understand how different types of operations on the data frame happens behind the scene. So let's start with the Hadoop's approach. So maybe if you, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, already had some understanding about the uh, Hadoop programming model. So Hadoop uh, offered a programming model known as MapReduce programming model. And MapReduce programming model uh, allowed us to create two functions. One function is known as map function. Another function is known as reduce function. And combining these two uh, to build our logic. And then you can create a chain of uh, map functions, or you can create a ch chain of map and uh, reduce functions to achieve your logic. To give you a sense of how MapReduce worked, uh, I'll come back to this diagram and explain uh, about it. But to give you a sense of how MapReduce uh, worked, uh, let me show you some code example. So maybe you can come to my um, GitHub uh, repository, GitHub page, and look for this is public it should be at, open for all link is github.com slash learning journal and maybe where it is i have a lot of things there uh you might see something like hadoop tutorials it's a public repository and in this you can see uh, MapReduce examples so i'm just trying to show you one uh, MapReduce example uh let's say playtime average right so MapReduce was available only in java so this um, Hadoop offered MapReduce framework to write distributed computing logic, right? But uh, the problem was that it was only available in Java, and hence uh, it was a Java technology, uh, restricting everyone else uh, who doesn't know Java to work on this technology. So um, in MapReduce, what we used to do, we used to write Java program. And uh, even if you don't know Java, it doesn't matter. I'll just uh, walk you through. Uh, in Java, we usually create one class and everything is packed inside the class. So let's assume I have this play average, playtime average class. So basically what I want to do here in the in this class, we write two methods. One is map method and then one reduce method. 
or map function or reduce function and that's that's what map reduce was all about you write your logic uh, uh, using only two functions map function and reduce function it was like a black magic those days uh, and in map function um, the map function structure was fixed uh, the parameters for the map function were fixed the first argument for the map function was key the second argument for the map function was value and then last argument was context context is like your uh, information about the map reduce framework right so three things were there and in the map we we used to write map function and when we submit this application at the end after writing map function and reduce function we also uh, write one main method which uh, starts the program right so what do we do in the main method uh, we create a job right and uh, give some configuration to the job uh, if you don't give anything a default configuration will go uh, give a name to the job and then to the job we tell what is the main class where you can find the map and reduce function so we tell the class play time dot av play time avg uh, we defined here that class same class and then we tell what is the mapper uh, class so within this class we will have one mapper class play time avg mapper which i defined here like play time avg mapper class and in that mapper class we will write map method right so and then we tell uh, what we tell mapper class and then we tell what is my reducer class so this is my reducer class and uh, which is also a class uh, defined here and inside the reducer class we define a reduce method so we tell <clears throat> that what is the main class what is the mapper class what is the reducer class and <clears throat> configure a <clears throat> job and this job will automatically uh, detect and assume that inside the mapper class you will have a map function and inside the reducer class you will have a reduce function so that is how the framework used to work and then we also tell uh, so where is my data file coming from so we tell input path which is nothing but a directory location right so we tell where is the data file where is the data sitting so that the framework can read data from there and then we tell where is where do we need to produce the output so that is also a directory location so we tell the directory location that this location you should write the output and then map reduce was all about key value pairs right so your data should be defined as a key value pair your in, uh, and your output should also be defined using key value pair so uh, so we also tell what is the key class i means what is the data type of the key uh, so data type of the key is like text and what is the data type of the uh, value for output so we tell that output uh, value should be a long uh, it's a long number right so that that's how we define the job now we you will learn that in modern days we create a job completely differently right so this is how map reduce work and when we submit this what uh, hadoop map reduce framework will do it will go and read the data file from this path right and read it line by line at a time it will read one single line right and after reading that line from that line it will read key and value so line should be broken into key and value right so assuming it's a text file uh, so what it will do it will maybe uh, line number becomes the key and the entire line becomes the value right so we get key and value so what framework will do framework knows that you have a map function defined here so it will read data from the directory data file and take one line and call the map method and it will pass the key and value uh, based on the data file right so it will read key and value from the data file and pass it in the map function and then inside the map function you can write your logic whatever you want to do with the key and value so in this example what i'm doing is i'm just splitting the value key is like useless for me because it is uh, just a line number and uh, so what i'm doing here i'm splitting uh, splitting the key and value with the comma and creating a, a string array okay so what i'm doing is maybe i know my data so in data uh, fourth column is start time fifth column is end time of a video uh, played right so what we are in building a logic is taking the start time converting it into time uh, data type taking the end time converting it into a time data type and calculating difference here converting it into millisecond and that's my output so map method was designed to take one row at a time do the processing based on your requirement and produce the output for the one row so my output here is uh, again key value so entire thing should be key value right so uh, key is maybe uh, the field um, play time second what it is maybe it is the uh, field name of the video video name or something and then it is the calculated time uh, difference the video play time which i calculated here so it goes in in as an output so but important thing is <clears throat> the map reduce framework how map reduce framework used to work <clears throat> so the map reduce framework as we can see from this example or understand from this example that map reduce framework will read data 
you are not reading data right you are just telling this is the directory where you will find data so framework will read data and then framework will loop through all the records and call map method one by one passing each record and you you write your logic in the map method to process one record and produce the output output should be in the key value format and then give that output back to the framework we are not writing it anywhere right so context dot write me context is your handle to the framework so you uh, context dot write will give it back to the map reduce framework so we give key and value uh, pair as an output back to the framework and that's done with the map method so once all the records are processed by the map method framework will end of the day framework will have all the outputs so let's assume in my text file in my input file we had 1 million records so 1 million times map method will be called once for each record and it runs in a distributed manner and at the end framework will collect 1 million outputs for each record right it will be key value pair so in this example let's assume that framework has collected 1 million outputs and those 1 million outputs are like video name and video play duration right so once the output of the map function is collected by the framework then framework will uh, sort it sort it means by uh, what what output we are producing play video name and play time right so it will group all the video names uh, same same video names uh, together and uh, play time for each uh, each record right and then create an array so uh, what array structure would be like one video name each unique video name plus uh, array Uh, with the values of the play time right so let's say out of 1 million if we had uh, 10000 uh, video 1 or v1 or viva1 is the video it played uh, and we had 10000 records for the viva1 so what it will create uh, it will create one array element uh, where key name is uh, viva and in the array 1000 uh, play times right so that is called sorting and shuffling so map reduce framework will do that work and finally it will call your reduce uh, method so if my uh, one out of 1 million records if we had 1000 unique video names or 1000 unique keys uh, here so it will create 1000 uh, array elements one element for each unique key or for each video name right and then it will start calling the reduce method and reduce method it will call 1000 times why 1000 times because there are 1000 uh, unique keys in the uh, data uh, output right so viva the, let's assume the first element is uh, first video is viva1 so it will uh, key will be viva1 and then it will be a iterable long writable this is an array uh, so play time for all 1000 uh, records that we collected calculated here will be passed in the in this array right and then we what we will do we will uh, build the logic based on this right and for this example the logic is simple uh, we want to calculate uh, sum of play time by the video right so for each video we got an array where all the play times are added in the array so what we will do loop through array and sum it the values right and get the final sum uh, divided by uh, count which most likely is uh, uh, divided by count to get the average right so that's what i'm calculating oh, so it's not sum it's an average and once we calculate the result so for one iteration of reduce method we will get all the values for one unique key will calculate the result and then pass it back to the framework so uh, context is your handle to the framework so we write context dot write will pass the result back to the framework right so and then framework will start writing it into the output directory that we defined here so i hope it made sense and uh, it gave you some idea of how map reduce used to work so to summarize this in map reduce we will write logic using map and reduce function map function uh, and tell the map reduce framework where is my input directory and where i expect the output and then submit the uh, application map reduce will start the application read data from the source uh, directory and start running a loop uh, where it will call map method for each record map method will apply the logic on each record produce the key value output and pass that key value output to the framework and then framework will do shuffle short activity which is nothing but creating an array uh, for each unique key and then once that uh, array is created this uh, framework will start calling the reduce method uh, passing one element from the array at a time and then you will do the aggregation logic in your uh, reduce method you want to calculate sum or average or whatever right and then after calculating the aggregate you will pass it back to the framework which framework will start writing into your output directory right that's how map reduce used to work it looks like just using map and reduce functions what can we do uh, we can do very limited number of things but that's just an assumption because mm, we find it difficult to build solution using map reduce but in fact just map reduce 
using just MapReduce, uh, people developed uh, entire SQL engine. Right. So if you uh, uh, go back uh, by history on MapReduce framework, on top of MapReduce framework, later in the Hadoop system, people defined uh, Hive Data Warehouse. And Hive Data Warehouse uh, allowed us to write SQL queries. So like select a star from this or select and whatever, uh, almost all SQL constructs, grouping, aggregation, filtering, blah, 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 whatever we can do in the SQL, everything was defined uh, by the Hive, offered by the Hive. And behind the scene, Hive engine translated those SQL queries into complex MapReduce logic, MapReduce algorithm. It generated MapReduce code and executed it on the Hadoop framework. Uh, so though MapReduce looks super simple, uh, small thing, and we feel like, how many problems we can solve using the just two functions, but that's not the fact. The fact is that MapReduce allowed to build complete SQL engine. That means almost all data processing problems uh, were being solved by the MapReduce. And building Java application for MapReduce was a black magic. It was uh, not many people were able to do this. And that's why Hadoop MapReduce programming was uh, quite difficult those days. So that's about MapReduce. I hope you understand the MapReduce, uh, how MapReduce uh, program used to work. Now coming back to our uh, discussion. Right, so how MapReduce worked? So in MapReduce, uh, we define map function and we could chain map function. The example that I showed uh, was a single map and single reduce function, but it was also allowed to chain map function. And how framework worked? Framework will pass the input to the first map function. First map function will produce the output, which will go to the framework. Framework will save it on the disk so that it doesn't lose the output. And then if you have one more map chained after the first map, uh, framework will pass this output to the next map method. So again, one more loop will start and the framework will keep on passing your output to the second mapper. Take the uh, output from the second mapper and save it on the disk so that it doesn't lose uh, the result uh, in case of failure. Uh, and then uh, this output becomes input for the next map in the chain. And finally, the output of this map also goes into the disk. Uh, we keep it on the disk. And then let's assume you after three maps, you have a reduce. So this output goes for a shuffle that I explained. Shuffle means aggregating and uh, uh, your uh, output by key and creating a huge array of uh, key value pairs, right? So that's what shuffle activity will do. So, but shuffle will happen only if the next in the chain is a reduce method, uh, how you have written your logic, it depends upon that. So the final uh, map output is produced here and it goes for shuffle. And once the shuffle result is prepared, then that shuffle result will start passing to the reduce function. So map reduce will keep on calling reduce function for each uh, row in the, uh, shuffle array and then reduce output will go and sit on the disk because that's your final output that's how map reduce used to work and they and in this approach in this uh, logic people find two kind of uh, problems first problem was performance problem what they said that every map output is going on the disk uh, every map output is going on the disk uh, so we are each stage we are performing two io operations once the output of the map goes to the disk so we have a write operation and then that same output becomes input for the next map. So we write one more uh, read operation and pass it to here. So for each this blue box, we have one write and one read operation on the disk. Disk operations, disk IO are slow. So it causes a lot of delay uh, in the performance. So that was a performance overhead people identified in the map reduce. So they wanted to improve that. The second thing they identified was uh, that map reduce programming approach is constrained. Constraint. The biggest constraint was that you have to apply your brain, think everything in terms of map and reduce, map, map, map and reduce, or map reduce and then again map reduce and then again map reduce. So, which is difficult for programmers. Um, solving any problem with just a screwdriver is kind of impossible. So, map reduce was not a screwdriver. It was a kind of very powerful tool. It was possible to solve all the problems, uh, all the most most of the data processing problems using map reduce. But thinking and building that solution was kind of impossible for a general or a average programmer. Only uh, top-notch experts were able to do that. And that was a problem for the business because business uh, want uh, people who are, uh, who are business want to adopt technology, which is easy to learn. Uh, experts are available at low price, low cost. So, and you don't need kind of uh, aliens to do that work, right? So. That was another problem. So thinking everything in the map reduce was uh, kind of uh, very difficult. Both these problems were taken up by a group of researchers at UC Berkeley, and they tried to solve both this problem. And the result of that solution was known as Spark. Right. So let's look at what Spark brought. So I'll just move it here so that you can see. OK, so Spark came up with the similar idea of map, what MapReduce uh, offered. 
right so what they uh, but what they changed hmm, they uh, took control out of framework at many places hmm, and gave it to uh, developers that was the first uh, idea they brought so if you look at the map reduce framework and we uh, discussed that in the map reduce approach framework was responsible to read data from the data file or directory and then call the map method in a loop one by one passing one record at a time so all you were doing is telling the directory location to the framework and that's all you cannot read uh, data or you don't write code to read data right so uh, all you do in the map reduce is tell the framework that this is the directory you will find data files in this directory go and read it and pass call my map function uh, pass one record at a time but spark came up with the idea of a read method so uh, they gave control in our hand as a developer as a programmer that we call spark dot read method and tell how to read data from where to read data and then in the uh, then the framework will read the data from the location and create a rdd and give you an rdd that was the original idea in the beginning uh, so this thing gave us control in developer's hand and it opened a scope for a reading data from variety of sources right map reduce was reading data from the disk from the directory only now we got a spark dot read method and then uh, spark dot read method allows us to uh, read data from a directory read data from a file read data from a table or build some additional connector to read data from a relational database read data from a kafka read data from a nosql database the entire uh, world is open now uh, through the read uh, method and through the additional connector so that was one very innovative idea that uh, uh, spark brought on top of the map reduce the second thing that they brought is that after reading they create a rdd and give you a handle to the rdd right in map reduce framework was calling your map method passing one record at a time it was done by framework but in spark what they said we will give you an rdd what is rdd uh, that was one of the biggest innovation of the spark uh, the idea of rdd rdd the full form of rdd uh, is uh, re resilient distributed data set so there are three terms here resilient distributed data set right so they created an rdd they called it rdd resilient distributed data set but at the simplest level what is an rdd or with what you can resemble or uh, compare an rdd you can compare it with a list in python at the simplest level so what is a list in python a list of records right record 1 record 2 record 3 record 4 like that a collection or a array or a list whatever you call it, right so rdd at the bare minimum uh, idea it was a collection of the data so what spark did using the read method it created an rdd which is nothing but a collection of records taken from the source either it is disk or source system or whatever taken from the source and brought into the memory so it's so rdd you can think of rdd as a, a data set or a collection of records which is sitting in the memory now you have nothing to do with the uh, disk it has come into the memory right and you have one variable or pointer or handle uh, through which you can access this rdd so that was the idea of rdd we will go further into it uh, to understand what it what exactly is it is and what uh, resilient distributed data set means but as of now you can think of it a simple collection of data and then what uh, they did the spark creators they did one brilliant thing what they said once you have a list or something like a python list or something like a java array or something like a scala array right once you have an array or list you can apply a bunch of functions on top of it right so if you uh, to understand that idea so let's come to the python documentation so once you have a list all you it becomes everything everything becomes easy you can define methods on the list object right and method name is append extend insert remove pop clear index right a bunch of methods you can define a huge list of methods on the list object same idea they took they defined rdd which is something similar to a list or a collection and then they started defining a bunch of methods not these methods but those methods that we uh, know now right so they started defining methods one method is map which was originally there then they defined one more method called filter then they defined method group by then they defined method aggregate like that they defined 70 80 methods on top of rdd now think about it what happened as a programmer initially in the map reduce framework all i have to think is map and reduce so map 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 and reduce now i have 90 80 70 methods 
right? Uh, I have a filter method, I have a group by method, I have a aggregate method, I have a select method, I have a map method, I also have a reduce method, I have 70 methods. So instead of two tools, two functions, map and reduce, now I have, I have 70 methods. So that opens um, my mind and simplifies my work. All I want to do is I want to read data from this RDD and filter some records out of it. Maybe 1 million records are there, but I want to filter on column, on fifth column and uh, take only uh, those records that qualify the filter. And thinking a solution for that is easy because now I have a filter method. Right? So that was one more uh, innovation that was powered by the RDD itself. The only idea of creating an RDD uh, enabled Spark creators to define a list of functions. So that was one more improvement that Spark brought on top of uh, MapReduce. Then what they said, the problem of this performance overhead, uh, because every output of map earlier was going to the framework and framework was forced to uh, keep it on the disk. What they said that we read the input from the source using the read method, bring the data into memory. So RDD, all the data uh, is sitting in the memory in form of RDD. And if I apply a map method, the output of the map, map method can also sit in the memory. Why do I need to bring it on the disk? The idea, the reason for putting it on the disk was uh, that what if your uh, job fails? Or since behind the scene, it runs in a distributed manner. So there are uh, 100 parallel map functions executing on a distributed computer. What if one of those fails, right? So how do we protect uh, uh, against the data loss uh, of that failure? So they said, no, 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 that's that's not a problem. We keep it in the memory. If one instance of the map method fails in the parallel uh, processing, we will restart that map method. Uh, RDD is also already there. So input is already there in the memory. If this map, map, one instance of this map method fails, we will read it again, we'll restart the map method, we'll read it again and produce the output again. Why do we need to keep it in the disk? Uh, that will be easy. That will uh, uh, take less time compared to reading, writing it to disk and then again reading it uh, from the disk. So what they uh, decided that each intermediate output of these functions will be kept in the memory only, right? But what they couldn't solve uh, solve was uh, the shuffle part. Uh, when when you have some aggregation, uh, shuffle is required for aggregation. All these were earlier uh, solved by the map function. Now we we are using function names like map or filter or group by. Uh, but whenever we have an aggregate at that time, a uh, shuffle activity must be performed by the framework itself. And for performing shuffle, uh, framework will have to uh, hand over data from one machine to another machine in a distributed manner. So that's a little complex. And uh, recomputing that part uh, from uh, memory will require recalculating everything, the entire chain. Uh, so that's a that's little risky. Uh, and maybe end of the day, that might not give us any benefit. Uh, so what they decided is uh, we will keep, we'll put data on the disk only before the shuffle. So if you compare it with the MapReduce, all the intermediate outputs uh, except the shuffle were uh, translated or optimized by Spark uh, by keeping intermediate results in the memory itself. So uh, that was uh, another improvement that Spark brought. And at the final uh, stage, MapReduce, after the aggregation, the reduce method gave uh, output to the framework. And framework was responsible to write it to the disk. Right? They also improved that part, giving us a write method. So on rdd.write method, uh, was similar to rdd.map, rdd.filter, rdd.groupby, rdd.aggregate. Uh, they also gave rdd.write method. So final stage, when you call write, then only Spark will write the data to the output location. And this also improved, uh, gave us uh, opportunity to create multiple connectors, right? So write method uh, can be configured with multiple connectors and we, cannot, we can write it to wherever, whatever place we want, not only to the disk. And that was a limitation here, right? So uh, Spark solved, uh, Spark write, opened a new um, series of opportunities for creating right connectors and right to any destination, right? So that's how, that's the story behind Spark improvement. Uh, the lesson that you want to take out from this is that uh, Spark, uh, the read method of the Spark, Spark.read method that we already learned, uh, brings, reads data from the source and brings it, it into the memory. Behind the scene, it is known as RDD. It is is stored in the entire data is stored in the memory as and that uh, is known as rdd and then whatever methods we apply on that uh, are executed in memory nothing goes on the disk only those methods that require shuffle will uh, force a spark engine to save data on the disk and then uh, after that final output we can write to any uh, any output location so that's how spark uh, was designed initially and then uh, with 
they came up with an improvement on top of this also and that improvement was data frame so earlier it was rdd the initial uh, invention that spark has done was rdd and then next level improvement they did is the data frame which is we are using right now so everything remains as it is we use spark dot read method to read data from the source instead of creating an rdd now the newer versions of spark the latest one which we are learning will produce a data frame for us behind the scene behind this data frame there is a still rdd which is hidden behind the data frame but they uh, created a wrapper on top of rdd uh, called it data frame which was an improvement i'll talk about what was that improvement and then rest uh, remained the same all these methods were written on top of data frame and we can uh, process data using these methods and write the output so what finally happens so let's let's talk about the rdd and data frame difference so when initially they created rdd as i mentioned rdd was nothing but a kind of array of data right so if your file comes with uh, 10000 rows in rdd you have 10000 rows that's all what it didn't have what is the column structure what is the column name for uh, in that row what is the data type for each column so point is rdd did not have any schema so no for for an rdd it was just a row a record a line what is the meaning of that line that was missing in the rdd rdd were schema less and it was left on the programmers to impose a schema on on top of rdd right so we should uh, in the next step in the processing we are not learning spark rdd apis but if you go back and uh, look at the maybe some examples are there in your uh, course to help you understand that but when we read data as an rdd uh, it becomes a simple line of text if it is a text file it becomes a simple line of text and then we have to impose a schema on it we have to define a, a schema definition a class uh, for uh, 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 for the schema and then add that schema on the rdd so that we know what columns are there in that text how that row is uh, broken down into columns what is the column name what is the data type and all that and that was a wasteful activity for a programmer so if i'm working on rdd apis every time i read data create an rdd then every time i have to uh, impose any schema on top of it because without a schema it is very difficult to process column by column uh, right so to avoid that wasteful effort from programmers they created data frame and data frame comes with a schema plus rdd right so how data frame is different from rdd rdd is schemaless and data frame is rdd plus a schema both combined together is known as data frame and then all the methods are schema aware on top of rdd right so that's the difference between data frame and rdd and so uh this is a pictorial representation of what happens now uh, with the latest uh, data frame apis what happens when we do this kind of operation the read operation you are familiar with this so what i'm doing is spark dot read method uh, because that's how we read data in spark and then i tell what is the format of the data and then i give some additional options like data comes with a header uh, so i'm telling spark data frame reader to skip the first row and uh, use it to define the column names and then i'm also telling infer schema equal to true that means i'm telling that uh, go read the data and automatically infer the data type for each columns right column header defines the column names uh, column delimiter is csv so col columns are separated by uh, comma uh, but what is the data type of each column so for that i'm telling uh, data frame reader that go and automatically infer the schema read some sample data and understand it looks like integer or it looks like a string or it looks like uh, a date what it is right so and infer it automatically why because data frame cannot exist without any schema that's the difference between rdd and data frame data frame must have a schema on the data right so i'm forced to uh, tell that infer schema uh, because i want to create a data frame if i don't tell infer schema then i must tell uh, some schema myself and you will learn how to uh, define your schema explicitly instead of inferring a schema in the coming sessions or lectures uh, and if i don't tell spark to infer a schema and i don't even tell uh, a schema explicitly spark will make some default assumption it will make everything a string but a schema will be there right uh, without a schema you cannot have data frame data frame does not exist without a schema rdd exists without a schema so that's that's the difference between rdd and data frame so what uh, spark will, so if i run this code what spark will do spark will go and read this data file from the disk this location uh, take the first row uh, for um, defining the column names read some records from this uh, file to make a guess about the data types of each column and create a data frame and give me a handle to the data frame 
and once i have the handle i can start applying transformations on this data frame but behind the scene this is data frame behind the scene we still have an rdt right and data frame contains information about the schema and data so information about the schema is contained in the data frame object and data is contained in the rdd object so behind the scene behind the every data frame there is an rdd and this large one is known as logical rdd uh, which is uh, uh, which we can uh, directly access or program through the data frame apis so this is known as lo logical rdd it doesn't contain data it's just information about uh, where is the data because this spark is a distributed application so data is distributed across the cluster so let's assume you are running this code on a 10 node cluster uh, and you are reading this file this is maybe uh, uh 10 gb file let's assume this is 10 gb file so when you read and create a data frame uh, spark will in uh, store schema information in the data frame object data it will uh, store data information in the logical rdd object and that logical rdd will have pointers to rdd physical rdd partitions and each partition stores some part of the data so if this file is like 10 gb maybe you can have 10 partitions let's assume you have 10, 10 partitions uh so each partition might have 1 gb of uh, data right so and each partition may be stored on one one machine in the cluster so on 10 machines 10 uh, nodes in the cluster each machine might be storing this one physical rdd partition and all that information is stored in the logical rdd object which uh, knows where is the first partition where is the second partition where is this third partition on which machine which node which uh, place how to access that uh, all that information is stored in the logical rdd and behind the scene this is Uh, made up of multiple physical rdds i'm not going into the details of how many partitions will be there what will be the size of each partition how many records will be there in the partition all those we will learn uh, in the uh, coming uh, sessions and lectures as of now i'm just making an assumption that this rdd is made up of 10 partitions so you will have 10 partitions all those partitions are stored at different places in the cluster and each partition is loading some data from the file right so file is also uh, stored on the distributed cluster it is also broken into small small blocks and those blocks are stored on the different different uh, machines so uh, or it is coming from a distributed storage like uh, amazon s3 but uh, rdd will read it from the storage and bring it into the rdd partition which is your physical rdd partition so that's how uh, data frame is structured that's how data frame is uh, behind the scene it is uh, created now can we see this all this is like your uh, concept right a theoretical concept can we see can we use this code and see this rdd and uh, all these physical partitions yes we can see uh, we can see and let me show you how to see that and for that i have created a small uh, notebook here uh, same code that i showed on this slide is written here so what we want to do is spark dot read and read data from here create a data frame data frame name is uh, file df so i don't know if i have a cluster running no it is not running so let me delete this and create a cluster it is a single node cluster uh, but that's fine for uh, the demo we can see so once this cluster is started we can run it so what i want to do here is uh, read and create a data frame and then we want to see the physical the logical rdd the thing that i showed you here logical rdd and we also want to see the physical rdds how can we see that right so for seeing that uh, because all these things are sitting in the memory the logical rdd is also sitting in the memory and all these physical rdds partitions are uh, also sitting in the memory so can we see that in the spark memory unfortunately uh, we cannot see it directly uh, in the spark memory we don't have tool to see um, um, spark memory until unless uh, we pin the data in the memory so uh, the point is that we have to uh, pin this data frame in the memory and then spark will start showing us so i'll create it create a data frame and then i will execute the df dot cache cache is a method defined on the data frame uh, and it what it will do whatever rdd and rdd partitions are created behind the scene this data frame they are already in the memory it will pin it there so cache method will uh, make sure that it is sticking into the memory uh, until unless we want to clear the cache and once it is cached we can see it and that's what we want to do we want to see where it is uh, Uh, see the structure of our logical rdd and physical rdd so second step i will do cache but cache is a lazy operation in data frame most of the operations are lazy so cache is a lazy operation what it means even if i execute the cache it won't pin the data into the memory so what i have to do i have to uh, uh, run one action after the cache so what i i'm doing here i'm executing a write action on the write method which is an action uh, on the data frame so that it uh, caches the data into the it executes everything and then uh, data is cached in the memory and i can see it 
what is this write operation many of you uh, already learned data frame dot write right data frame dot write is uh, the way to uh, write the data frame uh, and in the format we tell which connector do we want to use and you might be using csv parquet delta different kind of connectors what is this noop or connector so noop is a special connector known as no operation connector right and this is specifically designed uh, for investigation purpose uh, if i want to investigate something and i want to execute uh, the entire code uh then uh, i can use noop operation uh, which simulates the write so in the noop operation mode should be always overwrite and in the save method you will tell some locations so this is the location where you can go and save uh, the data it will execute the entire write operation but it won't create any output at this location and that's why it is known as noop so whenever you are you have some code you want to run an action on the code so that everything is, thing is executed and then you want to do an investigation uh, we normally use noop write so when we start learning more about performance tuning and uh, investigating performance problems uh, this noop write is very frequently used in uh, those scenarios right so i'm doing a noop write i hope the cluster is started so let me attach it and then i run this df dot read it will read data it will infer the schema it will create the header uh, and create a data frame out of it and once that is done i will do the cache cache is lazy so nothing will come in the Uh, nothing will happen but uh, where do we go and in, do uh, see all this right so for looking at what is happening behind the scene we go to the spark ui so spark ui you can go to your cluster and in the cluster you can find the link for spark ui from here click this it will open in the new tab and spark ui is the go to place to see and understand what is happening behind the scene we also use spark ui for investigating different kind of problems mostly performance problems what is happening why it is happening uh, how much time my job or my process is taking what are the different uh, pieces of execution happening which piece is taking how much time why it is taking so much time all those investigation we do from the spark ui so spark ui is your go to place for investigation or for looking at understanding what is happening behind the scene so we will start using it from today onwards uh, very very frequently so uh, this is done uh, and let me run the cache method it will it should complete quickly i don't know why it is taking time because it is lazy uh, but this is let's come to the spark ui oh, maybe this is done mm -hmm. so let's come to the spark ui in the spark ui there are so many tabs here jobs tab this tells you how many behind the scene your code your i executed this code so how many jobs it triggered behind the scene so we see two jobs here uh, but we will come to this uh, later and try to understand it later uh, a storage tab is the place where you you can investigate the memory right so a storage is not about disk storage it is about uh, what is cached or what is there in the memory so you we won't see anything here because nothing is cached yet because this cache operation is lazy so everything looks like 000 but if i execute this uh, noop write op operation spark will again trigger everything and uh, try to simulate the write operation uh, for writing the output at this directory and in that process cache will be executed right so cache is lazy but write operation will make it happen so once this write operation is complete uh, we can see the data frame in the spark memory so let it complete so prashant i can ask one question yeah. so yeah as you said that noob is not writing into the this location so no so it is just simulating a write at this location but if you go after this write operation if you go and uh, take a list of this directory nothing will be there no, no data is created so because noop is designed specifically for investigative purpose so and the idea is why do we write if we are running it only for investigation let's simulate the write operation and don't uh, unnecessarily do the io and uh, clutter the directory uh, okay so it mean if after this if you want to read this file we can't read it means the directory yes yes because nothing is uh, stored there got it okay so this is done now if you come to the storage tab and refresh it you will see data is cached here so this is your logical rdd the big box that i told this is your logical rdd cached in the memory uh, a storage level it is saying that disk memory deserialized 1s 1x replicated we will learn more about these things but it says uh, the storage configuration is disk or memory if everything fits into the memory then great if not then cache few things in the local disk that's fine there are nine partitions so that entire data was broken into nine smaller partitions uh, nine nine of these right so it uh, in stores information that we have this logical rdd is made of 
of nine physical RDD partitions. 100% of that data is cached in the memory and total size is 451 MB uh, in the memory, right? If you click this logical RDD, it will take you down further and show you the nine physical RDDs, right? So these are your nine physical RDD. These are the RDD names, RDD 12, 0, 12, 1, 12, 2, 3, 4, like up to 8. And size of each RDD partition, it is telling 23.7 MB, 55.5 MB, 55.8 MB. So Spark uh, did a great job uh, creating almost equal RDD partitions. If you look at it, uh, it's all almost equal. It's like 50-50 approximately. Uh, not exactly, but uh, approximately 50, around 50. And the last one is whatever is left over, right? So it will be small, all this. So you can see nine physical partitions. And you can also see uh, size on disk is zero because everything fits into the memory. So only size in memory, everything is in the memory. You can see where it is cached. So this is the IP address of the executor uh, where this partition is cached. We are on the single node cluster. We are running on the single node cluster. So everything is on the same IP address, right? If you have multi-node cluster, then you might see different different IP addresses for different different part RDD physical RDD partitions. So some may be stored on one machine, another one may be uh, cached on the different machine. This one might be on a different machine. But since we are on a single node cluster, we only have one machine, so everything is cached on the same machine, and IP address is like same IP address uh, everywhere. Right, so that's how um, RDD is cached, and the I hope I uh, helped you understand uh, how data frame behind the scene is uh, created and is stored physically on the cluster. Behind the scene, data frame is an object in memory object uh, which uh, stores information about the schema of the data, and then it also stores a pointer to the RDD uh, logical RDD object that is also an in-memory object and then logical rdd object stores pointers uh, to the physical rdd partitions so when you create a data frame uh, it is everything is lifted and brought it into the memory right but in memory it is broken down into small small partitions and is stored across the cluster on different different machines and when we start doing processing like apply transformation uh, all those transformation also happens on in parallel individually on those partitions and that is the topic for next uh, session i'll uh, help you understand how transformations, uh, different types of transformation. I talked about uh, uh, transformation that doesn't require shuffle and transformations that require shuffle. So both type of transformation, how that happens uh, physically on this kind of physical partitions that we will cover in the next session. And we end today's session here. Uh, if you have questions, maybe we can take a few questions. I'm already over time, but that's fine. <music>